It is up to you to figure out what causes you to lose power, how fast you lose it, why you lose it, and to decide this is going to end now. In your second level, I want you to look at, you're in a building, and in your second level you can see more. What are you looking at in the second level of your psyche? You're looking at what you can own. You're looking at the world of stuff. But how you look at stuff is what stuff will protect me? What stuff will enhance me? What stuff will keep me safe? What stuff will give me more? I need stuff. That's the lens you're looking through because you're looking through the archetype of survival. I need to survive. How much stuff do I need? How much stuff do I need? I need more, 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 more. So in this win, you're going to encounter your addict. Every one of you is an addict. Don't ever tell yourself you're not, you are. So the first thing you're going to put down is identify what you are addicted to. If you put down chocolate, you're going to make me gag. Put down what you are seriously addicted to and where your addictions cause you to compromise your character, to lie to yourself, to compromise your strength. Addicted to, for example, procrastination. Putting off to, do you ever read the doldrums? Do you ever read that book? Oh my God, one of the funniest things I ever read in my life where this guy gets up in the morning and the first thing he does is postpone what he's supposed to do. And then, that's so exhausting, he takes a nap. And then the schedule is so hilarious I, I, thought I, would, I, I thought I would die laughing from this book. It's called The Doldrums. And then, of course, because he postpones his life, he goes into The Doldrums, and that causes him to have to take a nap. <laughs> I mean, this, this, book is, this book is one of the best. Did you ever read um, Confederacy of Dunces? I mean, one of the great classics of all times. Confederacy of Dunces. Ignatius J. Riley. Writes the history of the world on a big yellow pad. Okay, so you are going to identify your addictions. If you don't have 30 of them, you're not out of the room. <laughs> but I am talking about you recognizing that the, the, what Buddha would call an illusion. I want you to really get something here, that everything that you actually have identified things in the world that you've decided, I must have that. I must have that. Not that, but this. And that it's totally subjective. There's no truth to it. And just as an aside, when, when we talk about the pursuit of truth, this is it. There is no truth to the, the fact that you actually need that. It's just that it's subjective. I've decided that I need that. I must have. When people say things to me like, I must have quiet, and I must have this, and I must have this diet, and I must have this, and I must have this. This is all made up in their head. This is all made up in their head. As my father would always say, there's no such thing as an atheist in a foxhole. If you're starving, you will eat anything. And your list of what you must have goes right out the window. And that's really who you are. As the options of life go up, so does your ego and your fussiness. Oh, now I get to choose. 
and your choice gets more out of control. And that's what you have to reel in here. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? You have to reel it in, and you have to take a look at what is it you actually need, what is it you want. And it's at this level you have to become, and here's your operative word, discerning. Discerning. If you're a diabetic, you actually do need to avoid this. Discerning. So, I want you to list five things you really are addicted to, including things like attention, the need to be right, addicted to control. I want you to identify, and when you identify your, addic your addictions, make sure you pinpoint, like, I'm addicted to controlling who? Not everybody. And I want you to pinpoint, because come over here. Here's your body. When it comes to pinpointing how you lose power in your cell tissue, you have to become pinpoint accurate. It's not enough, and this is what I learned in my years as a medical intuitive. It's not enough to say, I have control issues. And your biography becomes your biology. It's, I have control issues when it comes to this person. So when this person walks in the room and this person says that to me, my blood pressure goes up. If I walked in the room and said that to you, nothing would happen. If a stranger walked in and said, I am like this. But when that person, when my niece comes in the room and says, oh, I'm da 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 da, I go, okay? This is the difference. I have an investment. <clears throat> Now you know what I'm talking about. So I don't have control issues with everyone. I don't give a damn what most people ever do. And so when you are dealing with control issues, pinpoint what you're talking about. Pinpoint. When you're talking about your addictions, pinpoint them. You don't need everybody's attention. And if you do, that is an issue. <laughs> but <clears throat> unto itself, whose attention? And what are you willing to do? And why do I want to pin you to pinpoint this? Because let me play this out. As we get up here, as we will proceed today and tomorrow, life is about going from external chaos to internal guidance. From you taking your clues as to what to do with your life from the external confusion, like, I've got to get out of this job. It's just so crazy, and I don't like these people. You will start, when you're, a, when you're a baby human, taking your clues as to what you should do based on the chaos in your outside world. But eventually, with any luck, with any luck, you will begin to develop inner senses. And regardless of whether the outside world is calm or chaotic, you will take your clues from your inside world. And when your inside world says, I feel empty, I've got to get going. I need to move to my next step. I need to, I need to go. I, I need, this, I'm done with this. I need to move on to my next step. I have finished and completed this cycle of my life. I've completed a cycle. So it doesn't matter if this level is calm or if this level is abundant or if this level is full of resources. I'm done with this cycle. I'm done with this field. I've got to move on. 
I'm getting inner signals. And you begin to respect your internal signals over your external. This is a big, huge difference. And now you're beginning to realize this upper, what I cannot see with my eye, what I can see with my inner world, is much more valuable than anything on the outside. So how do I navigate my inside? Okay, so it is important for me to direct you to sensing, to, for, to recognizing how well do I sense when I'm hemorrhaging on the outside. And if you recognize I have addictions and I'm anchored here and here and here, oftentimes your anchors will block you from listening to your upper deck. This is my point, that you are so anchored. And I, and I really, I really, I don't like using myself as an example, but in this case, I'm going, I, I really, when I was in New Hampshire, I, I, <clears throat> my wiring is on, uh, just a little unusual. When I was in, no, no, I, rec I recognize that. Really, I do. When I lived in New Hampshire, I, and I had, a, I had a publishing company and blah, 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 blah. Um, I came home one day. I, f I was teaching in England, came home, flew down, landing in Boston, look out the window, and I realized this isn't my home. This isn't my home. All right, that's my first clue. And I was actually aware, why am I feeling this? Why am I suddenly feeling, after 10 years, that I don't belong here? All right, I get to my farm. I walk in, I have a coat on, it's, it's February. I have my luggage. I open the farm door, I walk in, and I hear, go home. Now, when heaven talks to you, when you get guidance, heaven does not speak in paragraphs. I'm telling, this isn't funny. I'm telling you the way it is. Heaven never speaks in paragraphs. It never uses any words it doesn't need to use. It never repeats itself. You are supposed to act on the guidance. You don't say what? Because there's something about guidance that is so clear and so not you. You do not get to say, oh, but what's going to happen to me? You never do that. This is not how you respond to heaven. You never, ever, ever, ever do that. This is what you do. I put down my luggage. I had my coat on. I went to the phone. I picked it up. I thought to myself, where can I move immediately? Immediately, I've just been told to move. What were my immediate resources? The only place I could move in the immediate was Chicago, back with my mother and my aunt. I, they, could, they would take me in. It would be one place to go. I wanted to move to England. I thought, well, OK, I will do one thing at a time. But I had to go immediately. So I said, can I move back home with you? My mom said, of course, done. I called my brother. I said, will you come out here and drive me back? I need a van, da 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 da. Next, I still didn't take my coat off. I then called, what do you call that, a U-Haul? Yeah. And I rented a U-Haul. And then I called the um, airline to fly my brother out and a friend who would drive along with me in my car. I got my airline tickets. Then, still had my coat on. I walked to the other side of the farmhouse. This is a big 1820 farmhouse. I had the original half, very cold. And then there was the half they added on. I lived with them nine years. I love these people so very much. And I walked in and I said, it's time for me to go. I'll be gone on Friday. I had a cat named Mousetrap. I said, will you keep Mousetrap? 
she can't come home. She's not a city cat. And Friday, I was gone. I was gone. And it, and, I, and it was as simple as that. This is how guidance works for me. It has always worked like that for me. Always. Now, if I had said, but what about this? But what about that? Guidance, I'm telling this is the way it is for all of you. This is how intuition works. This is the speed of light. This is data at the speed of light. This is how your internet works. It works like the internet. It works exactly like that at the speed of light. When I do a reading on you, I get your data at the speed of light, your biology, your health. Everything comes in at the speed of light. It doesn't come in like that for you because you're anchored in your illusions. You're anchored in your addictions. You are anchored in the way you want to see your life and the speed at which you want your life to change. I don't have any problem with how fast I want your life to change. I have a speed of how I want my life to change. Are, are you with me? Yes. Okay. So I'm asking you to identify what your anchors are and how much you hold on to them. And, one, and the second one, I want you to, you have your addiction, but cravings. One of the ways you lose yourself is in cravings that you have. Cravings. Now here's a craving. It's very subtle, but it controls you. And it's the cravings to tell your story. But what stories do you tell about yourself? We all tell our stories. We all tell our stories. But what stories do you keep alive in yourself? Now I, for example, I love the stories of the miraculous that are in my life. I think they're incredible. They are incredible. And they inspire others. And they sparkle others with grace and think, maybe life is full of miracles and saints and healing, because it is. And I want you to sparkle with that grace. And, and, and when I tell it, I hope you can see I'm not kidding you. I'm not. But some people tell their narratives of suffering again and again and again and again and again. I'm not someone you want to ever tell that to. The moment you start telling me about your suffering, I'm going to shut you down. I will shut you down for your sake and say, stop it, la, 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 la. You've told that story a thousand times. Has it helped you? Because you are hemorrhaging. And I'm not sure what you want me to say. Poor you? Oh my, how much you've suffered? What do you want me to say to you? Do you want me to coddle you like a child? Because that ain't going to happen. Do you want me to not expect adult behavior out of you? Because that ain't going to happen. So the gift I'm going to give you is a dealt up. And recognize that telling your story as a wounded human is causing you to hemorrhage. And you have to make a decision that says, why am I sharing this? What am I trying to, and every time you tell a wounded story, I want you to, re to recognize that you are taking a cord of your life force and draining it like this. You're draining it. You're draining yourself, and you're draining someone else. And it is not serving you. Now, 
You can tell your story, but give it a different ending. Give it a different ending. What does a power ending look like? And when you can tell your story in a way that empowers you, you will tell the story in a way that shares power both with you and the recipient. So for this exercise, I want you to identify a story that you've told, a wounded story that you tell, but change the ending so that it empowers you and it empowers someone else. And watch how hard it is for you to do that because there's power in your wound. And if you struggle with this, identify why you don't want to change the story. Why you don't want to change it. What kind of power have you gotten out of this? This is that toxic power. This is why people don't heal. I know, I am the one who wrote the book on it. Yeah. Maybe, depends. It's always time for me to have coffee when someone asks a question, it's wonderful. <clears throat> this is a wonderful exercise. You may sound like, you may think I'm putting you guys on the rack, but I'm not, go. So if, if someone's had a difficult childhood, if, some, if someone's had a difficult childhood and they have not been validated. Might that be you? Is it on? Yes, might that be you? Yes. So you would get to say, since I've had a difficult childhood. Yes, since I've had Thank a difficult you. childhood and was not validated for many, many decades, actually. Like they say there's some... By whom? Who was supposed to validate that? Parents. Okay. They say that it is somewhat healing to get validation. Yes. From somebody That's like correct. a therapist. You have to get validation. Let me be very clear. You have to get validation. Keep going. Yeah, so therefore it is a certain repetition of, of stories of the past that were difficult. And this person says, yes, your parents didn't see it. They didn't support you. But I see it. And, and that yes. can be viewed as somewhat helpful. Yes. And that is a bit of repetitive, you know, getting it out of your system, yeah. the crap that happened to you. Yes. So where, where do you go with that when you say, like, I see what you're saying is you don't want to hear that. It's right, just... okay. There's something in the middle. You get to tell your story, but how many times? Right. And at yeah. some point, your story becomes a lifestyle. Right. And when your story becomes a lifestyle, you are now wound self-wounding. You yes. always, excuse me, have technical difficulties. Um, <laughs> What healing requires is that what life requires is every human being, every one of us, needs to be witnessed. We need witnesses that we're here, <laughs> period. We need witnesses. One of the reasons isolation is so tra traumatic is nobody's witnessing you. Every one of you, that's what friends and family are for. You're witnessing. Beth is one of my closest friends in the universe. But she's also one of my life witnesses. So she, she knows me as well as anybody. David's one of my life witnesses. We've been together 20 some years. So he's not just a business partner, he's a friend and a witness. And how often he will say to me, I know you. You're gonna da 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 da. But that's, that's hilarious to me now because it's absolutely true. We need witnesses. And part of that category is, that for, is the role of the holy witness, which is an archetype. It's an archetype. And the holy witness is what you're called upon to do when someone says, I've been wounded, and I want to share my wound. And when someone is wounded, that wound must be shared. And your role as a holy witness is to simply listen. Not jump in there and say, my God, who did that to you? 
No. You're adding to it. Your job is to witness as they pour their wound out. Just pour it out. And you may need to witness three times. Three. That's what you get three times. For your body, then your mind releases, and then your soul. Three times. Now the hardest part of this, and the most challenging, is that one of, I am convinced, I'm convinced, no one will ever change my mind on this, that our absence of holy language and our common parlance is one of the reasons why we have lost the capacity to serve each other in healing. And the reason is you, <laughs> there is an inability in all of you to use the language required to pinpoint the depth of the wound. The depth, the psycho-spiritual depth of the wound. And what I mean by that is this. Oftentimes, in seeking a healing, you are looking for someone to acknowledge it, to witness it. But in the witnessing, what are you actually looking to hear? What are you actually looking to hear? That someone would say to you, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do this. But in that, your soul needs something, your mind, different than your mind. Because your mind might hear someone say, I didn't mean to hear you, but you don't trust that. Why don't you trust that? Because your soul knows something different than what your mind is hearing. Please turn your phone off. I really resent that. Um, when your mind hears, I'm sorry, your soul hears, uh-uh, it was deliberate. It was deliberate. You deliberately knew you were going to hurt me. And you made a choice, and you knew ahead of time that this choice was going to damage me. And you made it anyway. And further, and follow me here, I know and you know that at the spiritual level, you were warned by an angel not to make this choice because that's how we're wired. And that's how the system works. That before you make a choice that qualifies for the word sin, an angel always comes in and says, are you sure you want to do this? Because you're about to use your precious life force to harm another life. And that heaven records. And that's why there is the word karma. That is what karma counts for. There's no karma about, you know, like you're late for dinner. This is where karma is incurred. When you consciously use your life force to harm the life of another person. And it is, which is why there's always that microsecond of intervention where you get a feeling that says, do you, want to do, do you really want to do this? And you get that microsecond holy pause that says, think again. And then the choice is even more conscious when you say, yeah, I do, as a matter of fact. And so that apology doesn't work because what's really required is the person says, it was conscious, and I sinned against you. It was a sin. Now we're pulling out the language that's required. What I did was a sin. It wasn't just a boo-boo. It wasn't a bummer. It wasn't just one of those things. It was a sin. It was conscious, and I chose to harm your life journey. 
so that my journey could temporarily or whatever benefit. And it was conscious. And I'm asking for forgiveness. That, now that'll clean out the wound. Got it? Does that work, Johnson? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. There's only so much a human being can do. Let us be clear here. There's only so much a human being can do to repair what a human being has done. There's only so much. And if you look upon that human being and say it's not enough. I want, you have reached the level in which you want to say to the human being, I want you to suffer now. I want you to suffer. And when you reach that stage of saying, now I want you to suffer because I suffered. I want you to be humiliated because I was humiliated. When you reach this level of being a perpetrator, you have to ask yourself, what am I becoming? How much has that wound deformed me? I was, as you were talking, I was thinking about this situation. Honey, I need that microphone closer. Oh, I was thinking about a situation with a very good friend of mine that I've known for many, many years that's almost like a sister. Um, and she used to say things to me that that I would always think, like, why, how, how could you say something so hurtful to someone that you purport to love? And while you were talking, I was thinking about that she used to do a lot of cocaine. And I wonder if the cocaine just interfered yeah. with her, her brain, sure. her, yeah. her uh, ability to hear the angels. You think? <laughs> Never mind angels. How about you? Don't even go to angels. <laughs> yeah. Okay, moving on. All right. Thank you, dear. All right. Does that help you when it comes to levels of this? And why it's, it, 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 you know, your capacity to learn discernment. What a wonderful word. To learn discernment. To realize this person that I am dealing with doesn't have the capacity to recognize the level of my wound in the soul. I can't keep beating them up for that. It's like beating up a four-year-old. And I can't stay wounded until they do. I can't stay wounded until they do. I, what am I doing to myself? There are decisions you have to, so that I can't keep standing in front of them and saying, I'm still wounded, I'm still wounded, so that I can, because this is like preposterous, and further, they don't care. Get it through your head. They will not care. They will never care. And that's something you have to get through your head. Because they weren't on the receiving end. And so you have to stop telling them. You have to stop wasting your life. That is your anchor. And this is where you have to say here, at this level, why are you doing that to yourself? Answer that question. Why are you doing that to yourself? Why are you self-inflicting? This is like being a cutter. This is being a cutter. This is being a psychic cutter. You're being a psychic cutter. Just know that. Why are you doing that? OK. All right, so you're craving some kind of something, and you're never going to get it. You will never get it. It is never going to happen. Now, from a, a symbolic point of view, Everybody is given this kind of wound to recover from. Everybody. You're just not doing a good job of it yet. But you will. Because you've been living in the idea that it's only you. 
You gotta get out of that, it's not just you. You gotta get out of the idea that you wanna punish them, make them pay, make them see what they've done. Nobody cares. It's an amazing truth, but nobody cares, and it's like, I gotta get out of here. And once you're out and gone, the light comes on. Because this is the archetypal journey. And that's, this, is, this is where the healing comes in, you think. It's like popping out of this dark tunnel and seeing all these other people saying, wow, I thought it was just me in there. And everybody's saying, no, 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 no. And then you realize, is this what that awful self-wounded, I've been in there all these years for what? For what? So this is what it feels like to take a deep breath and stand on my own and get going. Okay? But you have to identify how much you're hemorrhaging and why you're staying there. An answer to yourself, not to a therapist, but why you're anchored there. And I want to repeat that when you have guidance, and the guidance says, get going, you will pull out that wound even to God and say, no, not until you tell me why I was wounded. I am so upset. And I have to tell you, you will never, ever, ever, ever get an answer to that. Heaven doesn't answer that question. Heaven never answers that prayer, because what you're saying is, you so screwed up, and you owe me an explanation, and I am not playing this game of life until you, you explain yourself to me, and that will never happen. Never, it will never happen. So you, you have to say, I, you must have a reason I thought I was special, I guess I'm not. <laughs> this is really humbling for me. This is humbling. So I guess I don't have any special protections. I guess I have to get on with the business of my life. And you hold on to your wound because you think you were special, you're not. Okay. Um, I'm gonna really finish this and then I'll take questions, okay. I need you to identify at this level one thing, and that's that this is also the level at which you are forming your identity. So this is a really interesting question, which is how much of your identity and in what way is your identity woven into your wounds? into your past, into what you've experienced. And, I, and I, I mean this, when you think about yourself, when you think about who you are, how much of it comes from woundedness. Now I'll tell you something very strange, maybe strange, maybe a gift, I have no idea. I think it's a gift. I've had seizures. I had seizures when I was in the um, when I was in my early forties. Grandma seizures, and the result is that I don't have the magnificent memory I once did. I have half the memory I had in some regards, and my wondrous vocabulary that I, I, I used to go to sleep at night reading the dictionary and eating vocabulary. Eating it, eating words. And so my short-term memory is, is pretty dysfunctional. So if you came into my house, you're gonna see post-it notes everywhere. And I have to put things back in exactly the same spot, or I really won't remember where it is. I have notes everywhere. Now here's the wonder of it. I can't recall a thing in the negative world, in the funniest way. It's as if heaven wiped out my capacity to remember negative things. I remember all of the positive, 
but I can't remember negative. It is so joyful. It's like it pulled out the most interesting wires. And I thought, well, if, if that's what it takes, <laughs> you know, but I really can't recall. I actually don't have the wires. So it was like, you know, the, you know seizures, are seizures are called the mystic's disorder. Yeah. <laughs> There's nothing disorderly about it. And I really, I can't recall, like if someone said, what are the negative things from your past? I don't know. Because they're not negative to me. They're just not negative. It's simply not there in the negative way. And I can remember, I mean, I have not lost my capacity to remember anyone or any relation, none of that, none of that. It's just that nothing looks negative to me. Now, isn't that the damnedest thing in the world? I think so. I have to tell you, it pays off to take those wires out. Unplug them. You are not served by seeing things negatively. It is a choice not uh, it is a choice. It is a choice, and you are hemorrhaging. You are hemorrhaging for no reason. You actually think there's going to be a payoff, and there's not. There's not. There is no payoff. It is self-inflicted wound, and you think, oh, it shouldn't have happened. There's a lot of things that shouldn't have happened. Trump shouldn't have happened. A lot of things shouldn't have happened. But in some other scheme, we don't know why things happen as they do. And it takes a lot to get to the place like, like the Dalai Lama, like Buddha. Things happen. And, all, and life is the law of balance. And we have to choose to work on the side of the light to balance the dark. And that's the choice we have. So what I'm asking you to do is identify how much of you, how much of your identity in yourself is based on your past and in your woundedness. And how you think to yourself about your own identity. And this is a very important question. And describe that part. Because that's how you will, that's the narrative you will tell to someone. And it's about how you see yourself as weak or strong, vibrant, resilient, or fragile. And, 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 and here's something that I find very curious. I've been in the business now for years and years and years, although I don't look it, but when I started out, in the 80s. Doesn't time go fast? Bloody hell. Anyway, you know, when I started in the 80s, there was this enthusiasm about holistic health. And people still talked about the new age and the language that, you know. And in the, in, in, when I first started out as a baby medical intuitive, Mind you, I, I, I cannot emphasize how much I didn't know anything. There, was no, there were no other medical into there, I was it, right? And I never even heard about the very skill that I was good at, and I never wanted to do what I did. I had a genius for something I had no interest in and no talent for the thing I wanted to do, which is be a great fiction author. So anyway, and that is brilliant too. Because when you are given a genius for something you have no interest in, you don't fantasize about what you could be. And I was very blessed because I was all alone in the mountains of New Hampshire before Google. No, no, before the internet. Today, kids wake up and they plug themselves into themselves. And they damage their egos and their competition and where am I and how much and the da da da. I was all isolated. I didn't have a computer. I didn't have TV. I simply had my inner life and norm and patience and quiet for 10 years. How about that? 
How weird is that? Anyway, <clears throat> but in the early years, when I was doing these readings, um, the attitude in people was that illness came from negativity, that illness was like this, uh, <coughs> that it was one negative attitude, and, and that's what broke down your whole body. There was a simplicity to the way we operated. And that everything could be healed with a positive attitude. There was an enthusiasm, right? <clears throat> now it's so many years later, and in fact, we are more fragile than we were. We are more medicated, more drugged, more easily broken, more psychologically and emotionally fragile. We break down as soon as someone goes, we can't hold ourselves together. You tell me why. You think every single opinion needs to be processed, heard. What is that about? This is this third level. This is the third level. And this has to do with your identity. And this is subjective. And this is about you describing how important you think you are. And so I'm going to make you articulate that. Because this is where you lose your power the most. Is how you describe yourself in the center of your universe. And the insignificant place here is, am I running? You need, OK. Is what you see yourself as entitled to. And how your universe should run around you. Because from this, from this description, you have determined how all relationships should operate. How the world should revolve around you. How people should talk to you. What you expect in the world. What your expectations are. And what you think you're entitled to. So one of the words that you put up there is entitlements. And please put down five things you see yourself as entitled to. When someone puts down things like respect, you better put down who from whom. Because I assure you, if you walk down the world and you think everybody's going to respect you, you're crazy. You think everyone says, now there's someone I want to respect. <laughs> this is all in your mind. And that's the point you need to look at. Is nobody else is walking around thinking, now there's someone I'm going to respect. You got it? Nobody else is looking at you thinking, now there's someone who should be first in line. <coughs> These are all things you have created in your own mind. But you have created them. And these are all narratives that organize your world. So it's really important, because on the third level, when you get to this floor, this is how you create the structure of your love of power. And when you make decisions, you make decisions to support these narratives. And this is how you use your power. This is how you create your reality. You're not doing this. Yes, no? Oh, you're, you're just doing it here? I'll tell you why I, w I prefer that you write things down. OK. I, I prefer that you write things down. What I've learned in healing is that if you don't bring things the full measure from your mind into the physical world, you can't change anything in your biology. It won't change. Because all you're doing is keeping things at a mental level. But you don't just know that. And when you're done with this, I'll let you take a break. You have no idea how much your life is run on your entitlements. 
It's not until you actually articulate them that you get, oh my God, I really think I'm entitled to get this. Fresh water when you turn on your sink. I, I, I put that down, are you kidding me? You totally think you're entitled to that. You're not, you have to pay for it. You're not entitled to it. You have to pay for it. One of the things Teresa of Avila said, you're not entitled to anything. You have to live your life as though you're not entitled to anything so that you are able to recognize that when the most wondrous things happen, there is a force behind that and it's not you. You have to start appreciating that there are forces in the universe that are providing blessings to you. One of her great examples, I, I just adore her, one of her great examples is one of the experiments, just one of the things you should do, is when someone you love and you know loves you, loves you a lot, big, huge, go look at them when they're not looking at you. Go look at them when they're not looking at you and think, that person loves me a lot. That person loves me great, big, huge. That is just amazing. You cannot make someone love you. There is nothing you can do to make a person love you. Nothing, absolutely nothing. Love either happens or it doesn't. So now look at someone who loves you great, big, huge, loves you a lot, and then think, how come they love me so much? And then think, you know, if I, if God called me home, they would be so sad because their world would be incomplete if I was not here. And I know that. And their heart would break. That's big. How is it that they have come to love me so much? And that's what Teresa of Avila would say, because God set that up. God set that up. And that is a blessing. And that is how heaven provides for you. That you cannot make anyone love you, but suddenly love appears. Bingo. And this is how life is, like suddenly something wondrous appears. And if you want a good prayer, here's, here's a good prayer. In the quietness, just say to God, I am in the mood for something wondrous. <laughs> Why don't you pray like that? I do. Dialogue with God like that. Say, I am in the mood for something wondrous. I could use something wondrous today. Get busy, OK? Stop thinking that heaven is just there to rescue you out of hell. <laughs> Stop it. You have to think, you have to, and, and, sometime, and sometimes when I see things that are a crisis, I'll say, why don't you show off and do something? Go rescue this person. Send them a really tough ass angel. Learn how to pray with faith. And just say sometimes I'm on my porch and I'll say, I need, I'm bored, I need something wondrous. Send me someone, someone who's interesting, someone I could help, do something, and I'm going to work and I'm going to go make my dinner. Pray like that. Pray so you're always talking to an angel. One time, all right, one more story and I'll let you go. I, I developed mononucleosis, big, huge, bad, big, huge, not little. I never do anything little. This big, huge, big, huge bed. And I could hardly get, and I had a friend named Sally. And Sally had gotten involved with this Filipino healer, and she brought this healer to New Hampshire. And she kept insisting I go and see this healer. And I said, I am not going to a healer. Are you out of your mind? And I actually got to the point with this mono case. Well, I don't know if you know how mono goes, but I had 
break out in sweating and just, I was so weak that by 2.30, 3 in the afternoon, I couldn't get out of bed and I, it, was, it was horrible. So I finally called her up and I said, I can't move, I, I, ha I need help. So all the way she's driving me to see this healer way in the back of beyond in the mountains of New Hampshire and she says, oh, he's just wonderful, yada, 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 yada. And I began to feel like I was gonna find a way out of this nightmare. So I walk in and it's in one of these old New Hampshire little cottages and um, I see all these people enthusiastic with their session, the healing session with this Filipino healer. And not unlike John of God, yes? So I walk in and I sit down in a small a chair, you know, a lower, a regular chair, and we are knee to knee. And he says, how can I help you? And I'm looking at him and he's looking at me. And I said, just jumpstart me. Just give me some energy, just jumpstart me. And this is exactly what he did. He went, and he looks up and he looks at me, and he looks up and he looks at me, and he says, I can't help you, go. And I looked at him, he says, go. I can't help you. And, I, and I, so I walk out, and in my prayer, I said, oh, pfft, thanks. And I really did say, I can what, how, I, pfft, pfft. that's a prayer too. And, and so Sally and I get in the car, and she said, how was it? And I said, he refused to help me. He refused to help me. And she brought me back to the farm, and I just, you know, was, you know, racked with self-pity, and, you know, oh, well, I didn't pay me anything. Anyway, weeks go by. She finally says to him, why don't you help her? And he said, who is she? He said, a good friend of mine. He said, you know, she has this angel. And the angel stood between and said, don't you touch her. Yeah. And, and. He said, my angel said, don't you touch her. You let her go. And then it turns out that he had, he was molesting people. He was molesting women. And this, my angel said, don't you touch her. Really, but my point is, there I was feeling sorry and doubting. And, and honest to God, from that point on, I thought, God, bless it, you kick ass. And, and <laughs> you know, you never know you never know. And really, from that, I, I, honest to God, I'm always standing around saying, do something. Come on, do something. Don't, don't just stand there. I'm, I am in constant prayer. I would not give up my life for anything. I cannot, in, I cannot, I want to, I want to ignite this in you. I want to ignite it in you. You have to identify how you lose power and why. And how, how easy it is for you to say, that's it, I'm not hemorrhaging. Because the moment you get that is the moment you start choosing where to put your power. Where to put your power. It's not just about you deciding, I'm not going to lose my power here. Once you decide where you're not hemorrhaging, then you decide how to shine your light. And now you know what power is, how to direct your power. But first you have to learn how not to lose your power, how not to let someone command your power, how if someone walks up to you and says, I would never have a glass like that, and you find yourself depleted of your power because someone said something to you like that, are you crazy? Are you nuts? Is that all it takes for you to lose power? You cannot be that fragile. You must not be that fragile. You cannot allow anyone to command you. Anyone. You cannot allow anyone's opinion to matter. Do you understand? You cannot. You allow someone's counsel to matter, but not someone's opinion. Counsel is grace, opinion is trash. I'll explain that to you when we come back. You remember that. I ask for counsel. How often I've said to David, I want your counsel. 
It's a matter of regard. Do you think I ask for everybody's opinion? Never. Don't you ever, ever, you draw the psychic boundary. When someone says, well, this is blah, 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 you go like that. But you learn to be discerning whose counsel matters. That's what you invite in. Because an opinion, I mean, it's, it's, like, it's like here, bite, like a gnat. All right, I'll let you have a break.